So what am I going to talk about? Well, uh, I was thinking about this, and when I was in India uh, last fall, uh, I'm new, obviously, to this university, and I'm in the university, and uh, it's huge, just enormous. And one of the first things they ask me to do within a week is, uh, is talk to some of the uh, students there. And so they kind of marshal all these students, and I've got like 500 students in front of me. Uh, seriously. The place is packed. The audio auditorium is packed. And I talk a little bit about my work and, you know, some of the work that I do at the university. <clears throat> and it's time for questions. And um, one of the uh, students that asked me a question, he says, where do you get your ideas from? And I'm standing there, and nobody's ever asked me that question before. And I couldn't answer it. So this is an opportunity for me to try to answer that for you, because I've had some time to think about it. Usually, as teachers, of course, we, you know, we try to uh, encourage students and talk to students about what they're doing and kind of tease out what they're trying to think about and, you know, develop their own syntax, their own aesthetic. Uh, we don't usually do that within a classroom. So, I'm going to go back to being a student and that's where I'm starting with this presentation. So, here we go. One thing I might say, too, is that I didn't see Don show, but I've seen the video. And uh, I think probably one way to talk about or think about his show is maybe it's the space of nature, right? Well, mine's the nature of space, and that's what I deal with. And it's uh, through kind of a convoluted labyrinth, maybe, of education. So I'm going to start with this image. I'm a fisherman, fly fisherman. When I was a kid growing up in Cleveland, we don't have a trout. But I was infatuated with fishing and eventually went to Western Pennsylvania and reduced to fly fishing. And since then, we've hooked on that, pun intended. And, uh, when I was in uh, junior high school, I went to the, several times actually, to the Cleveland Museum of Art. Have any of you been there? Some of you? It's a pretty amazing space. Yeah. So is the African Museum. <coughs> but, uh, and I grew up in Cleveland, by the way. And this is one of the watercolors that's in that collection. It's a Winslow Homer painting from, it's only about so sort of that. And it's a painting done in 1889. It's called Leaving Track, obviously. And one of the things that impressed me about this painting, and watercolor can do this, is um, create these, this sense of space. Well, you see the object of the fish here, obviously. But that's not what Winslow Homer was painting. Was, Winslow Homer was painting a series of translucent effects in space that he, he's offering up on the surface of the, the fish here, as well as the, the backdrop of this painting. <coughs> One of the things that most people don't realize is that, and I've studied this for a lot of years, is that a native fish, no matter what species, is translucent. Its surface is translucent. So by doing, by being translucent, it has the opportunity to blend within its environment. So that environment, as it changes, so will the fish. Whereas a fish that is farm-raised is opaque, and it doesn't have that ability. So with the leaping trout and native native trout like this, um, and this is in the Adirondacks, is something that Winslow Holm would really appreciate. And when I went to graduate or undergraduate school 
and then started working for the university in the publications department <coughs> um, right out of college. And this is before my graduate work. Uh, I got associated uh, through serendipity with uh, Dr. Owen Lovejoy. And uh, Dr. Owen Lovejoy, Owen was a, is a physical anthropologist, and he's the one who determined uh, the first family of man, Lucy, maybe some of you have heard of this, an Australopithecine who was by, primarily a bipedal animal, walked on two legs, but three and a half million years old. And I was doing scientific illustrations from the original fossils, the bones, um, in, uh, from Ethiopia, in the lab at Kent State, because of my illustrations, my interest in fishing and travel. And one of the things that I was doing that were extremely representational, but representational in terms of identifying how these, uh, these things worked, so to speak, rather than depicting them as objects. And so, in scientific illustration, you probably may know or may not know that it's your, your job is to be didactic. You have to teach what you're looking at uh, through, through what you paint. And so, these are just, I mean, I did lots of these, uh, dozens of these. Uh, this jawbone um, is from Lucy. And uh, so the, the important thing about scientific illustrations like this is that it's all planar. And what you're trying to do is establish excuse me, surfaces that are kind of uh, layered in terms of the dimension so you can see how things work on the bones. Any physical anthropologist does this. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons why you could determine that the skeleton, remains of the skeleton, uh, were from a bipedal animal rather than, um, than a quadruped. And so we published work in National Geographic magazine and had worked on um, at the uh, Natural History Museum in Cleveland as well. So some of these were on display there. So moving forward, and this is going to get to my point eventually. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was commissioned to do a plate for the North Carolina uh, State Prison. And this is a, a plate that is sponsored by the Wildlife Department, and the proceeds go to the Wildlife Department. And so this is one of my illustrations. <clears throat> now, taking into account what Winslow Homer did with his fish, what I'm trying to do here is a similar kind of thing, and that is to see the opportunities of staging the dimension within a surface that is readable, but it's readable in terms of its levels, not only its levels, but in terms of its composition that it always keeps on shifting, okay, because uh, it's elusive. You can't measure that distance on that surface because it's optical. And so I did this for the state. Didn't get paid, and that's a good thing because, you know, they, when you do things for uh, public good, I, I really, my wife complains about this all the time, that why you're doing something for nothing again, you know, but that seems to be my routine. So, this, I know this is a big leap, but looking at that surface of the, of the tract, okay, and, and identifying the opportunities for scientific illustration as a didactic kind of uh, voice, visual voice, our world is just like that. That's how we, that's how we experience the world. And so, I was stopped in traffic, I can't remember where this was recently, and took my cell phone out and took a picture of it. <coughs> well, the, uh, you can't quite see it on the cutoff there, but you can see this image in that rear view mirror, and I'll be 
obviously this rear view mirror, uh, you know, deals with some other reality. And, of course, the windshield deals with another you know, kind of image of that. But it's all simultaneous, right? It's not different. It's not a, a different <coughs> single position. These are all happening at once simultaneously. So, to focus on an object, uh, which we're all accustomed to doing in traditional art, or even when we, we look at things in stores and so forth, it's object-driven, but that's not the way life is, in my opinion. So, um, I'm going to go back to something that I think is so important, and that is this idea. The idea of stir is, and this is an unusual kind of part of language, I think, that I haven't heard it much. But when I was at Kent State, uh, back in 68, I was a freshman. In 70, we had uh, a brilliant artist coming through, Robert Smithson, the earth sculptor. Have any of you heard of him? Spiral Jetty, does that ring a bell? That's him, okay? Well, he came by and did partially very Chet at Penn State while I was there. And um, his, uh, his motivation, much like Spiral Jetty, is that there's this kind of point that through which, well, let's talk about the, the, the very shed, where the, the ridge beam, when he's burying the shed, and you'll see it in a minute, is fractured. And when, when that fracture comes about, because of the pound of, you know, pounds and tons of dirt on it, there's little separation between the inside and the outside. It happens simultaneously, okay? That is, you can't measure the inside or the outside because having both of those things come about at once. Uh, these relate to mathematics, of course, and phonetics. But think of it, too, in terms of language. You know, when you say something, and it's not a word, but it's an expression, and you know what it is anyway. So this is one of his diagrams. And uh, along with the leaping trout, I think the other thing that changed me most was the opportunity to think like this through Smithson. I never thought like this. You know, I, <clears throat> I'm old enough to go back to, oh, uh, well, Obviously, my parents' world was Norman Rockwell. And now I, I see what lies those were told through, you know, in his work. And so being at Kent State, when Don was talking about, you know, this kind of in intervention of aesthetics, uh, you're looking at a person who buries a shed and changes my aesthetic altogether. Now, what's that about? You know, how can you process that? Well, this is, this is the way he thought. The things that were ultimately interconnected all the time. And the notes and all these things that he's talking about here are manifest in, in his work throughout his life. He died uh, not too long after he uh, uh, came to Kent in 70. He died in 73 in plane crash. Um, but he's done a lot of work and a lot of temporal work that I think I find fascinating. Philosophy, do you know Wittgenstein, the 20th century philosopher? 
The common behavior of mankind is the system of reference by means, reference by means, that is experience, of which we interpret an unknown language. Uh, so I'm taking this idea of the circle of our lives, you know, not the points of life that George H.W. Bush was talking about, but the in-between spaces. The in-between spaces are really interesting. And visible language is one of those things that are, that seems to be a fluid, rather. But I'm sure somebody did that because they wanted to do it like that. And it just came out like that, too. So these, I think, are phenomenological kind of metal art pieces that are not done by artists, their experiences. Oops. And this is partial very check. Okay? So when he used a dump, he actually hired somebody to do it. But they dumped this dirt that cascaded around like this and it broke the ridge beam. And so the inside became the outside. And the outside became the inside. And that was pretty amazing. Okay. Equally amazing was the fact that over time, and one of the things that Smithson does is uh, think about um, deterioration, entropy, as part of the art experience. That is how things kind of evolve uh, over time. And so what happened here over time, and this, this was all while I was, how did I have it? I was an RA at the moment right next to this. Is that um, gradually the erosion rainfall would fall on this, this pile of dirt, and eventually it came down to it was like you had, you took your hands and you grabbed onto the top of this thing and carved a groove, a series of grooves in it, like a seashell almost, that kind of formed ridges, you know, peaks and valleys as it wrapped around this thing. And it was filled with feldspar. Dirt was filled with feldspar. So in the evening sun, that late sun, that harsh sun, this thing would light up like a sequin gown. And it was truly amazing where this thing had these kind of gouges in it like that, and it sparkled. It was pretty wrong. And to extend this a little bit more, <coughs> another one of my heroes, have any of you heard of Gordon Mama Clark? No? Okay, well, uh, he, he's the son of a very famous surrealist. Um, uh, and uh, he produced this piece. He was an architect. He went to Cornell. And he kind of formulated this position of anti-architect where he would carve up buildings, cut buildings in half so they would fall apart. He would produce uh, optical spaces in buildings where you couldn't really tell anything where the wall was anymore, where the inside or the outside is. And this is in the map, and I mean the Museum of Modern Art, I'm sorry. And one side is one part of the house, and the other side is the other part. And these are presented just like this, okay? <clears throat> I, I think that what he's doing here is remarkable. I mean, it just blows my mind every time I see this because it's not about the piece. It's about what the piece makes you think of. So when you're looking at one side, you can't look at the other. And therefore, this memory of one side and the, the experience of the other side coincide and fluctuate back and forth over time and you can't help but take that away from, from the piece. So as you're driving back wherever you're going, you keep on flipping and flopping this piece back and forth and you can see how complex it is, right? Where's the door? Where's the interior wall? What's beyond the interior wall? What's beyond the surface? What's this stairway doing? What's this 
you know, what's this windowsill doing? What's that doorway doing? And how does, and we enter those spaces kind of like we normally do in this space or any other space. Normal human condition allows us to experience those things. Uh, and we expect them to be that way. Well, the unexpected is also part of that environment too. And I think he reveals, you know, a way of thinking about space in a far different way, much like Simpson does. Or Smithson, right? And so, these are two pictures, not one. This is one surface, and this along the back is another one. And I just put this together for the slideshow. And Don knows this. My favorite, very favorite material is paperwood panel. Uh, because it's material that has been reproduced, so it's simulacrum, it's a facsimile of something real. Okay. But it's also used as a replacement for something real. So it's a substitute reality. And oddly enough, you could possibly think of it as ecologically friendly because it doesn't destroy trees anymore. It's all photographed. However, the material that it's put on, or usually laminated too, like these, this happens to be uh, this this is an in an elevator in my red roof in Cleveland, Ohio, a couple of days ago, and the elevator is completely saturated with this wood, fake wood. Uh, this also is fake wood, and that's fake, fake surface too. And this is an edge, an actual corner of a restaurant there in Waynesville. So this kid is beyond that wall there, and that's in that plane. Um, <clears throat> so I think of this kind of synthetic material as a material that doesn't cover up things. It reveals things, the way we think, the way we work in the world, the way we substitute for reality things. Um, so I'm going to kind of kind of move into another realm of thinking that I enjoy a lot, which uh, complements the other part of my thinking. And that is, uh, recently I was invited to a show, in a uh, mail art show, a uh, magazine show in uh, San Francisco. And the theme here was perspective, and they sent out this little booklet, uh, you know, corresponding with, with some Share, share a little something. So this is what I produced. And this, this kind of uh, goes back to that question that I was asked in India. You know, where do you get your ideas from? Well, I produced this art test. Now I'm not going to go through the, you know, ask you how to solve the problem. Um, most people. Uh, in fact, very few people got the answer that I think is right. So I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is, what is the question? That's the answer. Because you can't answer it, right? So, that's what my art is about. What is the question? It's, there's no, there are no answers in my work. Um, So I do things that are not like this at times. You know, I do things for shows and so forth. And I did this uh, deck of playing cards. And it aligns with what I'm thinking. OK, so these are the cards. And of course, they're different colors. So you, you know, there's an orange one of these. And there's a burgundy one of those, too. And these are called non sequiturs okay? And you play the game this way. These are the wild cards, okay? And there's a thumbprint with different tree graphs on it, different designs for tree graphs. So the grafting message for that thumbprint, I think you can align that 
logically, is how you use that wild card. And the instructions are non sequiturs, play. Okay? So you decide how you want to play the game. It's up to you. And it's by consensus how you play the game. So there are no answers. There are only questions. You can ask with any way you want to. And I use these, I was part of a, a show in Washington, D.C. This is the show right here. That uh, was left, uh, I guess, two years ago. A year ago. And uh, that's the piece right there. It's called Duplex Working, Working Man Collective with John Jacob. And so this is the corner of the uh, storefront. Do a lot of pop-up shows and shows in, in warehouses and things like that, which I find to be really great. And these are the images, my images on top, and Tom's images from Working Man Collective on the bottom. And that's the inside of the space, which is quite wonderful. And that gives you a more detailed kind of image. So I took these playing cards, you know, which are four by fours, and these are 12 by 12s, and we mounted them on suction cups, and we made these parallels that are purely instinctive and have no real purpose alignment to them, you know, in terms of their uh, strategy. And then we used a projector and projected all of these images up there. And there's the inside looking out. And there is this mnemonic, this blue square. This is the same, obviously, the same proportions as the cards themselves. And that exists in one space alone. And again, another, you can see how the projection works against this. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> So you can see what goes on. I mean, this is traffic coming through. And so the whole thing mixes. It's kind of, you know, you're a startup, right? It's like all the configurations come together. It's a serve. That's what it is. So now I think I know what I'm thinking about. This is before I went to India. Okay. <laughs> And so I started doing drawings about drawings, and I had a show about drawings about drawings, and I started doing these, somewhat like the stacks of newspapers, uh, somewhat like, you know, where is the space coming from, right? Um, does it make sense? Does it have to make sense? Is there an answer? You know, all these questions. And I started playing around with, you know, these kind of nuances, and the four drawings that you see there are before India. So I wanted to bring those and show those to you because I've been developing this idea for a long, long time. These are from 2014, and I've been doing these for a long, long time, these kind of drawings here, which are these drawings, right? And these are drawings about drawing. That's all they are. They're not drawings about walls, they're not drawings about lines, they're not drawings about anything, but drawings about more. <clears throat> and I did a few of these in India, and of course the India aesthetic is different, it's a different world altogether. Uh, you know, they've been under the uh, uh, kind of thumb or umbrella of the United Kingdom for so many years, and the Dutch before that, and they recently received independence from all of that colonization in 1947. So being one of the oldest countries in the world, they're one of the youngest countries in the world at the same time. And it's a pretty perplexing experience, right, Janice? It, 
it's just a wild space, you know, it's really phenomenal. I love this space, I love it. Uh, and so when I was doing these drawings about Rome, I did a couple of etchings at, at an MS University in New York while I was there. And I did them quickly, you know, you can see that these don't take very long. And uh, it was a space that they weren't used to. And they really positively reacted to it because it was like a, an unusual experience for them because they're used to seeing American modern art. And they developed that that uh, connection because that's what the American model was and that's what the European model was. So, you know, people like Picasso or Moreau or, you know, the modern, the high modernists, uh, Rothko, etc., uh, were all kind of heroes for a Western way of thinking. Well, uh, you know, when you talk about Carl Andre or Robert Smithson or, um, you know, uh, some of the minimalists, obviously Morris, you know, others, uh, that's not part of their vocabulary because they're, they're interested in other kinds of things. Um, but, as I continue here, just showing you some of the drawings. Okay. And then, and then after I was doing those drawings, I had a show. And it was called, well, we had a visiting artist coming in. And I really like artists coming in. I think it's a real valuable experience for everybody, including faculty. And she came around, she was from the Chicago University. And she was looking at my work, and we were talking about so we were drinking coffee, etc. And uh, she said, you have an awkward sensibility. And I took that as a problem, you know, whether it was or not, I don't know. I think it was. But anyway, it's, and that made sense to me because sensibility is not conventional, I don't think. I think it has to be personal. It's a sensibility of a person, not a culture necessarily, an individual sensibility. So I did these paintings that in some way are kind of um, uh, influenced by those drawings, by drawing. And um, I started thinking about the labor aspect of building, you know, whether it be two-dimensional or three-dimensional, just performing the activity of building. So these aren't rocks, and they aren't bricks. They're a way, they're a manifestation of process, of just putting things together, like a jigsaw puzzle line out there. So they're not intended to be illustration. And when I was in India, I, continued, I introduced some of these drawings in a show, my first show there, which was several years ago, in a gallery, my gallery there in, in New Delhi called uh, Art and Aesthetic. And I did this show called Unlived Space. And I did these drawings for that here in this country. And these drawings. So you can see that these are more about the context of built environments or built uh, conditions uh, that in some way mirror the activity that you know people do when they build walls or you know they don't they don't think about necessarily what it looks like, they're thinking about what they're what, how they're building it and how it's performing as a built space and how each one of those elements becomes important in that space. That's my wife and my daughter, and that's the gallery over there. And this is one of the very famous artists there uh, who studied in Europe, and uh, Amat Shah is his name. And he's one of the elite, he's like the Picasso, if you will, of India. Uh, he's 80, in this picture he was 83. He's older than that now. And this is where I traveled. So the first time I was there, I traveled to these orange spots here. 
Sorry about the opera, you know, and the Taj Mahal, and I've got Jarpur with uh, palaces and forts. Obviously, Delhi is a, a double dip because I landed in Delhi, so I spent time in Delhi. And then I went to uh, Jossamer, uh, and that's out in the desert with camels and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, completely enamored by the experience. And so, I applied for a sabbatical, uh, which I took last fall. And these are the eight places that I visited on my sabbatical, which is in uh, Noida, which is right across the river from New Delhi. And uh, that's at the university. So I, I did uh, uh, briefs and worked with the graduate program in painting there primarily, but did some with graphic design uh, and method master's level work, all with master's level work. And then I traveled in between uh, my work there at Amity. And those are the places I went to, those pink places. And so I'm just going to go really quickly through a bunch of India images to get to get you familiar with them. So oh, I want to say that the second time I went there for my sabbatical, I intentionally booked my hotel at this hotel. Where is it? <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> it's somewhere in here. I don't know. But uh, it's called the hot spot. Right? Well, uh, even the, the Uber driver couldn't find it. And we finally found it. And I'm right in there somewhere. And that's what I want. Because I love this stuff. You know, it's visceral. Uh, it's uh, hedonistic. It's uh, challenging. It's dirty. It's uh, aggressive. It's all those things. And they, these are my, uh, we call, call us the, we, we call ourselves the fish club. Wanted to do that. He's the only uh, uh, Hindu. Uh, the other guys are from West Bengal, so they fish all the time, and I do too. And so uh, Kumar's plate uh, had no fish on it. was vegetarian only. But we were, this is where I was staying in the, the uh, residencies there. Uh, in, in, it was a great place, and the food was great. But they snuck this food in because uh, in Delhi, it's a Hindu area, and uh, you can get to go out to restaurants and eat meat, but primarily the public institutions or even private institutions only serve vegetarian food. And basically, that's what I ate while I was there the whole time street food, everything. Never got sick, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I love that food. That food is outstanding. And the, so this is what you get when you're in West Bengal. Of course, Kumar doesn't get that. You know, he doesn't get all the good stuff. So uh, these are pom that are plentiful there. And this is the faculty. They're really cool. And they're really informed. They're very, very smart people. So we have a blast. And so I followed that up while I was there. I took a bunch of pictures. And I'm going to pass this around because these are surfaces. So just go ahead and take a look at them. I'll show you a few of them. And I had this show that was based on it. I didn't have time to sit and draw or do anything like that, paint. Because I really didn't have, I was always on the move. So what I did was I photographed surfaces because I was really interested in the vocabulary of past and present contexts through surfaces. And we have that here in this country, but not to the extent that they do. And their surfaces are so visceral and vibrant. Uh, so this was the show card for that. And uh, uh, this was last year at this time, basically. And that was the show. 
scanning might get over there. And now this is a statement that I did. Architecture and Services encountered alongside the evidence of this decay and disintegration, which is coming from uh, Smithson. And this is the opening, and these are some of the prints. And th this is what I was photographing. And there are so many of them in that little book in here, you know, in the, this postcard book. But these are just a few of them. And uh, some of them get to be pretty uh, kind of extravagantly elusive, much like that combination image that, you show, that I showed you of paperwork and Oh, so for some reason that. So, anyway, so now I'm doing these surfaces, and I have all of these drawings about the drawing. And I'm looking at Smithson and uh, Richard Serra and others, you know, that are inspirational. Certainly, Marla Clark, uh, dressed in all colors, obviously. And there's a dance that goes with this, and it's a circular dance that involves going forward and backward in the rhythm. You, it's, it's literally three steps forward, two steps back three steps forward, two steps back. But it's extremely poetic and it weaves back and forth side to side with the cadence of the body as these bodies are moving uh, kind of fluidly through the space. And so this becomes a huge environment that is uh, just spinning all the time. And uh, it's marvelous. If you're on, um, um, on the second floor of the painting studio here. This is right in front of the painting studio. And so I, I sent this to my friend, uh, Mark Mothersaw, some of you know, uh, maybe Devo, Whip It, Whip It Good, anybody know this one? Well, he's out in California, he's a friend of mine. We went to art school together at Kent State. So I sent this to Mark. I said, stop, I can't take any more inspiration. <laughs> I really bad it too, it's like, blows my mind. So, now I'm thinking, I will display. Now I'm getting a handle on what this thing is all about. It's a series of flat experiences that are processed in an environment in one's mind to make a dimension. I don't think the world is anything but flat. I'm convinced of that now. Absolutely convinced. So, in this environment, it's impossible to read any kind of depth in this environment because it's so frenetic, it's so immediate. And you have to really parse out this and this and this and this and amalgamate consolidate all of that into one thought or several thoughts. But there's no way to separate that into thinking about the dimension or the whole dimension as a visual form. It can't work that way in my mind. There is no atmospheric landscape. There is no possibility for painting mountains anymore. They don't exist that way. Okay? in my mind. And so these are the quick images of India that I wanted to show you. During Pooja's celebration, these are common. This is in Calcutta. This is common in the marketplace, again, stacking, you know. Okay, this is a festival of colors in February. This is what a typical street looks like in, in the city. These are Hindu uh, uh, doorway uh, kind of uh, spiritual guard, guardians. Translucency and pattern, whimsical patterns that are Indian and by nature. Again, an image. Calcutta, a 
colors are everywhere like this. Okay? this is, that's in California, right by the mark. I, I live right like to you know, where this sign is if you go straight down and like right in there. In the countryside, this is what you see. This is really interesting. This is uh, cow dung, and each morning, this is in a village, I'll show you in a minute, uh, this is the threshold that has been scribed. Okay, it's a cement threshold. And uh, every morning, they swirl cow dung on, on the threshold as a sacred kind of process. Procedure to allow that day to open up for them. They wash them off every night. And they do that every single day. These are the people. This is one of the faculty members of Amity. And that, he grew up in this little tiny village. And, like, he's amazing. There's some of the colors in young women. Again, in the village. Group. These are the elders. I have to be the oldest one there, I think. And this is uh, Diwali. No, this is Dirk Puja, I'm sorry. They, this woman, she she went crazy on me. She, she attacked me and did this to me. <laughs> so much fun. She just rushed me. As soon as I turned the corner into her little space, and she just she had red on her hands. She just ran up to me in the face. And this is every uh, Dirk Puja is a celebration that lasts for four days, and they spend a year building these amazing structures like this. After four days, they dis discard the armatures or say. Everything is dumped into the rivers and ponds and things and they dissolve in that way. Uh, but these things are magnificent forms. Again, this whole thing is taken, this building, the complete building is taken down after four days. It's built for only four days. And of course, television there is consistent.
this is uh, this is actually in Magenta, uh, which is ancient. It's uh, second century BC, and all of this is carved into not all everything inside of these. There are like thirty some of these uh, uh, palette caves or whatever you call them. Uh, but each one of them. Nothing has been placed in them. They've all been carved out of the rock. So there's nothing put in. They've all been extracted. So this the entire process of this entire mountain is subtracted. And these are some of the tiles from, again, we're talking about, uh, you know, mid-Greek period, 2nd century, 3rd century, AD, uh, B.C. And then my work. And so my work, as you see here, these paintings are not derivative, but they're experiential. And that's what I tried to do in my, my statement here, is to not depict anything, but embody, you know, uh, in through color and through shape, and through that two-dimensional kind of uh, formulation of surface upon surface upon surface as an aggregate to build a kind of a, uh, a, a reportage or um, a, uh, a maybe a, a kind of an experiential facsimile of the conditions that I feel when I am in India and when I feel now about everywhere, really. Um, so, when I look at our landscape, which is very, very different, I can't help but see these conditions that are kind of formulated through pattern, through texture, uh, through color, through shape, um, that make me think that there's something, getting back to that art test, make me think that there's something other than what is there that I'm looking at. So with each one of these paintings, I'm trying to do that. I'm not trying to paint what is there or what isn't there. And uh, that's why it's such a difficult thing for me to do. So, oops, that's not supposed to be that way. But you know, because it's right there. And here is that. For some reason, it is. So I'm on the bus, and I'm going back to India now. Uh, I'm, I'm on a bus, and you can see that these are taped lines. This is a plastic wall, and this is not tile, it's painted. And the, the richness of looking at something that is kind of intentionally done to imitate something, but intentionally looking like it's almost not an imitation, is a real kind of confounding condition. So this is the room that I had at the bus station, which was not like any bus station here. And I really enjoyed this. Oh, here's the regular ones. I'm sorry. I don't know how those other ones got in there. So um, I'm going to end, I think, with this one. And this goes back to Kant. So you've probably heard of him, Kant, the philosopher. And his premise, uh, in much of the things that he's talking about in terms of kind of creating a modern way of thinking about the world, is that there, there is, and this kind of goes back to Marxism too, and that is there is a subjective universality uh, in all of us. That is, we all can agree on something, but we all see it differently too. And that conundrum of being different and universal, uh, subjective as well as universal, is something that we have to accept as part of our human condition. And what I'm trying to do with my artwork is to get closer and closer to both of those things. And this recent body of work was done after India, and that's why I think I don't know what I'm doing. Because this is, I don't know, just the start of what that is. So I think, and you can see, 
what somebody has done. I mean, some of you may think this is outrageous that somebody would paint red paint over a beautiful streamstone-built wall, mason wall. But that's that subjectiveness that somebody is putting into this thing, into this wall. It's actually painted like that. The whole wall is painted red over the stones. And it goes back to one of the earlier images. That condition is both that nuance of what is fake, what is real, what do you want to see in that wall, what, what is, you know, authentic. Is there this kind of in-between space that is both? Certainly in this condition there is. And I think things like this are so important for me as an artist, like paperwood panels. That's my job. <laughs>